This is a workshop, an artist workshop presented by Zach Manuel and Vashni Karen um, titled Elements of Documentary. And before we get into it, I wanna go ahead and introduce them both. Uh, if you've been in here before, you've heard me say Zach's bio a couple of times, but if you haven't, I wanna go ahead and read it just in case. Zach Manuel is an award-winning New Orleans bred and based filmmaker and the son of a touring jazz musician and community builder at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. His work in documentary and music video explores intimacy, black masculinity, class, identity, and legacy. And Vashni Karen is a Caribbean American journalist, filmmaker, and artist based in Los Angeles. Born in New York with roots in Barbados, Puerto Rico, and the West Indies, her cultural background has influenced much of her research as she connects to the larger diaspora folklore, spiritual through folklore, spirituality, and celebration. Her first short, short documentary, You Can't Stop Spirit, explores themes of identity, sexual liberation, and the freedom that Carnival lends in New Orleans amongst Black women. Uh, she's also worked alongside Lizzo as a cinematographer for her upcoming documentary, and she's an awarded 2019 and 2020 New Orleans Film Society Emerging Voices and um, Antenna Works Platform awardee. And so uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, first bring Zach to the stage to maybe go ahead and tell us a little bit about uh, what we can expect to get into with this workshop. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Xander Shea, for those wonderful introductions. Um, elements of a documentary. What is a documentary? What's the lifespan of a documentary? Where does it start? Where does it end? Sometimes it never does. Sometimes the beginning doesn't look like the beginning. So I really just wanted to kind of make this this uh, this workshop as an exploration of what um, just kind of all that goes into making a documentary from like the spark of an idea through, you know, through putting it out in the world, through it kind of living in the world and having this life beyond beyond even the filmmaker. Um, you know, the reason why the reason why I wanted to bring Vashni into this conversation is because the two films that we'll be using as a case study for this workshop are very different. Um, and, and there's really no kind of standard way to make a documentary. The, the kind of production uh, methods of documentary making are super vast. And so I wanted to kind of explore through this conversation, different approaches to making a documentary, different approaches to working with subjects or contributors or characters or however we call them as, as filmmakers in different fields or coming from different backgrounds. Um, and so even just to kind of intro, like the two films that we're gonna be talking about, my film, This Body and Vashni's film, You Can't Stop Spirit. Um, I just wanted to highlight, if you haven't seen them, they're, they're both great films. I speak for Vashni's film for this amazing and it really moved me, I watched it multiple times. Um, but I just kind of wanted to highlight like in broad brushstrokes, like what was different about these films before kind of um, uh, introing Vashni and then kind of jumping into the workshop. Um, so This Body is a film that I made in 2021, which is kind of a verite style follow doc that is following uh, one young Black woman who's from New Orleans as she participates in the coronavirus vaccine trials. Um, and it also follows a friend of hers who is in community with her, they go to school together. Uh, and kind of explores their contrasting opinions about vaccine trials, about trust and dynamics of distrust in the Black community um, and the roots of their distrust when it comes to the medical industry. Um, I don't want to speak for Vashni, but I, I do want to kind of talk about how I interpreted Vashni's film, You Can't Stop Spirit. Obviously stop me if there's something that I'm missing or it doesn't make sense or it doesn't feel right. Really? But, I was like, Vashni's film, You Can't Stop Spirit, is a non-linear, almost remix of traditional documentary that uses discontinuous voiceover, portraiture, stylistic edited sequences, and music 
to illustrate historical and con contemporary cultural practices of the New Orleans baby dolls. Whoa, <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you. Very different films, very different films. Yes. Uh, but yeah, welcome Vashni. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being in this conversation. And maybe just start by, Zandashe kind of gave intros, but maybe just kind of for those, you know, uh, yeah, intro yourself and kind of tell us where you're coming from. Yeah, first of all, thank you guys for having me. Um, you know, I've been a fan of Zach for some years before I even started really making films and your work has always been super inspiring. And um, yeah, I, I really admire it. So thank you for having me. I'm Vashni Karin, um, the director of You Can't Stop Spirit, which highlights the New Orleans baby dolls, their tradition that is a part of Black Mardi Gras. Um, I wouldn't say a lesser known tradition, but a tradition that hasn't been really highlighted or um, bring, brought into um, pop popular media um, for years. And um, they, they came out of the red light district in New Orleans. The, the tradition started in the early 19th century. Um, and basically the baby dolls, um, they, they came out during Black Mardi Gras, um, during Jim Crow, during the Jim Crow era where Black people weren't allowed to participate in Mardi Gras. So they made their own thing. They created a sisterhood of, um, protection, self-preservation, and they bring joy and um, celebration to the community. And this is something that really struck me in um, my personal life and also just in general. Um, this was the first time for me where I saw women living so unapologetically, so free, and really didn't care what anybody had to say about them or how they lived their lives. So this is what brought me to this film. And I can go on, but um, yeah, that's a little bit about, about the work. Thank you. Can we um, bring up the slideshow and just go to the second slide? Yes. So what are the elements of a documentary? What is the life of a documentary? And I, before we jump in, I was curious like, how many people in the, in the audience are filmmakers and who isn't? Maybe if you are a filmmaker, just like throw a hand in the chat or something. A lot of filmmakers, seems like a lot of people who are not filmmakers, that's very cool. Um, so yeah, I wanna, so basically in this workshop, we're kind of breaking down documentary into different, documentary making into uh, kind of different sections from research and development, pre-production, production, post-production, post and then kind of the extended life of a film. Let's go into the, the next slide. Okay, research and development. Is this film even possible? What does research and development look like? This is definitely not an exhaustive list, list of, um, you know, research and development tactics, but I did just want to kind of throw some things in there just to get an, an idea of kind of how a film starts and what the seed of it looks like. Um, and I'll jump off with this body. So this body came out of, in 2020, obviously we were all, trying to figure out life and trying to navigate the pandemic and all of its newness and its, its undulating dynamics. And kind of in August uh, of 2020, I started to hear some news reports about the vaccine trial um, and especially that the vaccine trial was gonna require a diverse audience um, in order to create an effective and safe vaccine. So for me, I was immediately thinking as a filmmaker who was currently working on other films that explored the idea of disproportionality or explored the uh, COVID-19's impact on the Black community in New Orleans. I was thinking like, what does this vaccine trial feel like for Black Americans and especially Black folks in the South? What's kind of the nature of the trial? Uh, you know, how are doctors, uh, communicating with Black folks that they're going to be running tests on. Are Black folks in the community, in the New Orleans community specifically, like is anyone interested in even signing up to be a part of this trial? So 
Um, not too long after that, I was kind of had the opportunity to apply for a grant through a new program called Hindsight, which is a partnership through um, uh, Center for Asian American Media, Firelight Media, and uh, Real South. And I was lucky enough to be given a grant to make this film. And so I started the research and development process. And so for me, the first thing that I wanted to look for, I mean, I did a lot of research on like just kind of the, the scientific methods of, uh, of a vaccine trial. And I think obviously as a black American, my like kind of gut instinct toward a vaccine trial was the Tuskegee experiments. So I just want to kind of say that as like, almost like this dark cloud that hovers over the process of making this film and, and kind of every decision that I was making throughout research and development. And, you know, is definitely gonna, sh it showed its head, uh, that feeling and that, that legacy showed its head in the research and development process. So what I wanted to find or what I, what I wanted to identify was a person who was a black Southerner who was voluntarily participating in the vaccine trial. So I like made a post on Facebook and went on Instagram and went on Twitter and I never go on Twitter, but I like made a Twitter and on Twitter, I was like looking for people who like looking for keywords and all that kind of stuff. Like what were people saying in community about the vaccine trial? Um, and a lot of it was very negative. People had very understandable distrust towards medical trials understandable distrust towards authority figures, especially when like we were getting different news and different uh, kind of the process of like how the government was understanding and disseminating information about the COVID-19 was really changing kind of by the week. So it was, I think it was really difficult to actually trust like these figures in power as well as the state was actively killing black Americans. So all that said, it was a very difficult period and I completely understood where people's distrust was coming from. Um, you know, there were university uh, deans at like Dillard and Xavier who were trying to advocate for the vaccine trial and were being called out uh, by their student bodies and by parents uh, as like trying to persuade people to be victims. Um, Eventually, after a lot of research uh, through a lot of different sources, um, I came across, uh, I was connected to a young woman named Sydney Hall, who happened to be a participant in the vaccine trial. And we just, I called her and we just had a conversation about what I was hoping to accomplish with this film. And I was just really straight up about, you know, I want to document your process through the vaccine trial from beginning to end from first shot until you're ultimately unblinded because it was a double blind test. So neither her nor the doctors or nurses who administered the vaccine knew if it was the actual vaccine or a placebo. And I really just wanted to document that process and create at the very least an archive of what that experience would be like for a Black American. Um, at that point, I had no other subjects or contributors identified and was just kind of following that thread of documenting Sydney's journey. Um, in tandem with working with Sydney, I was also reaching out to universities and archives and exploring the historical dynamics of distrust in uh, the black community. And that led me to talking to which is a super important conversation for the production of this film, Dr. Uh, Ruben Warren, who's the head of uh, uh, bioethics at Tuskegee University in Alabama. And so, you know, his connection to the Tuskegee experiments was very palpable and he was just a wealth of information. And I think also kind of changed the, the way that I was thinking about this film as in, you know, I had been thinking about like, there's this thing that's happening contemporarily with uh, the vaccine trial and then people feel the weight of history uh, influencing their trust in medical practitioners, but what uh, Dr. Warren really, you know, kind of instilled in me, which I think changed the direction of this film, was that, yes, the history is a really important factor in people's distrust, but if you look at what's continuing to happen today, uh, there is just cause for distrust in people's everyday experiences and people's lived experiences who are going through 
negative interactions with doctors and medical practitioners every day, friends, family, neighbors, et cetera. So that kind of changed the direction of the film and uh, influenced me to, to kind of look more broad, more broadly and outside of just Sydney's personal experience and to start to look at the way that her family and her community and her friends were also wrapping their head around this vaccine trial. So I'll stop there with research and development. And that was kind of part of what my process of, of even like figuring out if that documentary was possible to make and starting to kind of uh, conceive of what it would look like. And so I'll turn that over to Vashni. And could you talk about kind of what that process was like for your own film? Yeah, definitely. Um, I had a quick question though about about your process, and um, before I get into mine, I'm I'm curious if you had any personal stories with the medical system that really like sparked your inspiration to to go deep into this. Because I know I definitely do with my family. So yeah, for sure. I think it came from a place of like me personally not knowing how I felt about it. And like, I think I was, uh, you know, in the screening that we did the other night, like every film I feel like that I embark on is a question. And whether or not I answer that question, I think um, the process of making the film kind of uh, illuminates different avenues by which to explore that question. And maybe potentially those avenues can lead to an answer. So me personally, I came from a place of knowing people in my family who had extreme fever and anxiety of doctors that led to serious medical conditions that may have been alleviated if they had been treated earlier had it not been for that kind of ingrained anxiety and fear of doctors and of medicine so that was like in the back of my head like okay I definitely have seen what this discourse looks like um in my own family and I've seen what the effects and the impacts of it are. And I know that it's real. Yeah, definitely. I um, personally, like a lot of my family members, they advise me not to take certain medicines and things and just kind of work through issues. So there definitely is this huge fear um, in the, in the black community to, to go to the doctor. And I really think this is like, it's really important work that you, that you're doing with this because it's like, it's a, it's a big issue. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get into my research and development for You Can't Stop Spirit. Um, it started while I was at the university, uh, Xavier University of Louisiana. Um, the Dean Kim Voss DeVille had wrote um, extensive um, history and research on the baby dolls and Black Mardi Gras in general. And I had been in a senior documentary filmmaking class. I went to Xavier for journalism and um, I was in a senior documentary filmmaking class. And, you know, everybody went and graduated while I stayed behind and continued the work on the baby dolls. And um, I just kept following them around. I had a camera. I didn't really know how to work a camera probably at the time or interview properly, but I really spent a lot of time just um, sitting with them, speaking with them, and really just laughing and hearing their stories. Um, so it, it started there for me. Um, some years went by. I moved to Los Angeles and I worked in the industry a bit, working as a PA and, um, you know, worked my way up through, through the line. And something in me just wanted to come back and tell the story of the baby dolls and, and see it on a bigger platform because I felt like there are so many women in, in the black community in, 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 in the Americas and in the, across the African diaspora that need to remember what it's like to celebrate yourself and how important that is. So I, had, I wound up going back. Um, Obviously, I needed funding. I had gotten a grant from Antenna Works, and I was also in the Emerging Voices program through New Orleans Film Society, which you know helped a lot. I had gotten some mentorship there, and yeah, I mean, I really, in, in terms of reaching out to dolls at the time, it, it definitely 
I, I talk about how sacred um, the New Orleans culture is. It's something where, you know, you have to spend time. They have to vet you out and see who you are, especially as someone who's not born and raised in the city. You know, being a Black woman isn't always enough, you know, and they want to see who you really are. So it took time. I, I spent many years with them and there were certain dolls that I that I were drawn to because of their rebellious spirit. I think I was looking for women who bucked the system, who did things differently, who didn't follow um, what society. You know, they didn't. They didn't. They went against the grain, basically. So I found those women, and they really um, have huge presence within the film. Um, I I also self funded it a lot. I worked tirelessly and then would come back and like pay my DP whatever I had and my sound person and everything um and I had also gotten a some angel investment from a now producer named Jazzy McGilbert mm -hmm. she had um a lot of passion for this story and um you know for New Orleans in general so that's that's pretty much how I started it out yeah Cool. I love that. I feel like, yeah, these stories are all, they're like actually very different in like almost every way. Like, yeah, <laughs> you had developed a long relationship. I was working on, because I was working within a, a, a grant and a commission, essentially, I had like just a couple weeks to like identify and reach out to and like build that connection with the main contributors in the film. So yeah, it's it, interesting to think about how different processes make different films but yeah ultimately they're all a part totally. of totally did you feel like you know being that you had um you know this your film had been commissioned already like did they keep up with you and um how like the story was going artistically did they have artistic input in your project totally totally and um, uh, once we get into kind of like production post-production I'll jump into that but yeah it yeah was, that's a huge conversation <laughs> yeah it was uh it was a process but yeah let's move into uh pre-production sounds good I see Anissa and this in the in the audience I know Anissa can speak to that too because we were in the same cohort together oh wow um so pre-production what do you need to make the film and you just kind of touched on that uh that me but you know I wanted to just go through this list Contributors, who's in the film, who are your characters, stories, stakes, what is the story, what's at risk, um, what kind of storytelling tools, equipment, methods does the story inspire or require, um, crew, if any, schedules, it always goes longer than you think, I feel like, and your kind of story, yeah. option, which in the best case circumstances is a working document in the worst case circumstances has nothing to do with the fin finished film at all. Um, so just to jump into like um, stories and stakes, uh, you know, I feel like I, I, I kind of like had an idea of what the stakes are and maybe I should reverse those, but I didn't quite know what the story was gonna be, you know, and I knew the stakes were like, you create an effective vaccine just not not you as in like any one person but just like the figurative proverbial you create an effective vaccine or black americans continue to die at a you know two times higher rate than other non-black folks well really white folks due to the coronavirus so those were kind of the stakes um Typically when I, when I'm like thinking about making a film, I'm, I think what's kind of primary to, to making a good film or to crafting a good story are relationships to me. And even though I'm a DP, I don't really think about the equipment aspect of it, uh, maybe as much as people might assume. And I'm really wanting to just like have the least amount of equip equipment and personnel possible to tell a story and especially given that like we wouldn't have a lot of time to build relationships and I also come from like working on projects that span you know half a decade and and so on like I'm used to kind of taking my time and be able, being able to get to know people and like hanging out with them without a camera you know and it just kind of like being a fixture of their lives a little bit even before shooting begins um so for this story I didn't really have that luxury 
Um, but I think, you know, where, where my head was at was like, what's kind of the least amount of people that I need to actually make this story. And, you know, essentially beyond a couple interviews that we shot with two cameras and some drone work that we did, um, it was really just me and my producing partner, Lauren Cargo, who were the sole crew. And I would do camera, Lauren would mic people up. Um, and that was, yeah, and that was kind of it. And we would just kind of go into environments and spend time with people and try to respect what their requirements or what their obligations were to life and, and try to, you know, capture i'm like a verite doc person so i'm always like let me just hang out with you and let me just see what's going on or let me come to this doctor meeting let me you know let's sit down and have like a really on the fly conversation about something uh etc so that was kind of my thought process around how i was gonna make the film obviously when you start and not having a story i think it brought me in many different directions so not only were we uh, talking to Sydney Hall, who's like the main contributor in the film, but we were also interviewing and shooting scenes with many other people who had previously participated in the trial, had had negative experiences with medicine and who were not participating in the trial. But we were really looking at kind of a vast assortment of people around South Louisiana um, and going out and actually filming with them. And none of that stuff actually made it to the film. So sometimes that's how it is. Like, and it's a part of the process of research and development uh, or it almost like pre-production. And I talk about that now because like, I feel like once the actual, once we kind of did that work of talking with a wide swath of people and thinking about that content, uh, thinking about what we had learned and gleaned from those shoots, I think it, it really clarified how we were gonna tell the story, which was to just focus on Sydney, who was actively participating in the trial and her surrounding community. Um, in terms of our schedule, you know, schedule's tough. And I feel like schedule a lot of times is really dictated by what your budget is. Um, you know, we're in a fortunate position that I have my own film company with my own equipment. And so I was able to kind of shoot whenever needed and kind of be a little bit more at the whim of the contributors to capture what was important. Uh, even if, you know, there wasn't that much lead in time to it. Uh, so for that, you know, definitely really fortunate to have that. But, um, you know, obviously I think our schedule would have been shorter had we not had that luxury. Um, and then in terms of the outline, I think my outline probably changed a dozen times before, you know, I stopped working on it and just made the film. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So in terms of contributors, um, I had so many different people working on the film at different times because everything was based on the budget that I had. Um, but Consistently, um, my DP, Calvin Blue Jr., worked with me throughout the whole process, and he was really lovely and great, and super talented. Um, in terms of story and what was at stake, I think for this work, for me, it's like I saw, I was seeing a lot of stories in the media about, about Black women that weren't really uplifting or uplifting our people or Black women in general. So I really wanted this piece to charge individuals. I want people to to watch this film and feel like they're experiencing um, the highest version of themselves through these women who are inherently experiencing their most highest selves, right? So that's kind of like what was at stake, not to like make it super deep, but that's kind of what it was for me in this in this work. Um, in terms of storytelling tools and equipment, I, um, yeah, I had to be pretty intuitive on when to bring in cameras, like big cameras, or when to downsize and you use a DSLR. There were definitely moments where I decided to just go in um, just with me and a camera instead of bringing a whole crew with sound and everything like that. I, I did find that when I had a whole crew, um, some of my protagonists were a little bit performative and that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted like authenticity. I wanted them to feel 
like, you know, they were your auntie or your mom or somebody that felt close to you. So there were, I remember viscerally, like there was a moment where I had a whole crew and, you know, I wasn't getting what I wanted. And I, I told the crew, you know, you guys can just like cut and put the cameras down and I'm just gonna go outside and hang out with them. They had gone outside to, you know, take a cigarette break or what have you. And um, I had my sound equipment and I just recorded the conversations and like, I would ask them questions, you know, with the recorder in my hand, like they knew I was recording and stuff, but I would pivot and, you know, ask que ask non-traditional questions like, you know, how, what, what's some advice you would give me as a woman, you know, going through certain things and they would laugh and cuss. And that's kind of how I was able to get all of those, um, all of that expression. So I really, I really recommend like just always being super intuitive and, um, you know, don't be afraid to downsize and, and switch it up. I think the most important thing is sound. So if you have good sound, and you know you you're into I'm into stylistic visuals, so I always know that I can like come back and shoot something else, shoot some beauty shots, and and put it over the sound. Um, as far as schedule, oh my god, like you definitely don't want my advice on this because I literally just let myself flow. I think New Orleans is a has its own cadence, and you have to go with that rhythm. Um, so I definitely, I was shooting probably for about a year and the film was only about 15 minutes long, but then again, I didn't have any, um, it wasn't commissioned by a company or anything. So I could kind of take my time. I knew story wise that I wanted to show the process of becoming a baby doll and for them, like, like the coronation process of being a queen or being this figure in, um, during Mardi Gras, right? And uh, yeah, I kind of I kind of just went with that, and I had a feeling. I just had an intuitive feeling, like I think I'm done. I think I got enough. I have everything, and I really just let myself play with the footage, and um, didn't really just I didn't put too many constraints. I wasn't pressuring myself too much on like story and points. I really just um, went with the flow with this work. So that's that's how. I I came to. Cool. Yeah, I feel like there there are a couple like really interesting points you made, and um, just like how the environment of a documentary production actually can dictate what its ultimate form is going to be. And I think a lot of times you will think about like, oh, I want to make this film, and I want it to look like this, or I want to reference this piece, or I want it to feel like that. But the reality is, when you get into an environment and you're actually working with real people. Right. All that stuff can go out the window and they will essentially dictate what the structure of your film would be. And I think it's super important 100%. that you know, sometimes you would just have to drop the camera and go out and hang out. And in, in, in kind of that space of creative revision and, and kind of instinctual storytelling, you brought your audio recorder. Right. Another that, thing is too right. that yeah another thing I didn't mention that just came to mind as you're saying this is like there were moments where I'm I'm testing out comfortability at all times because it's like also I I think I realized that like black women are used to feeling safe all the time you know and it, it takes a while to gain trust and sometimes we would do recorded phone calls you know in some of the audio in the film it sounds like it's from a phone and it actually is. So, you know, sometimes you feel more comfortable talking to somebody on the phone versus when they're in person with a camera and audio equipment. Like there's there's different levels of, um, of openness, I think that one has um, depending on the equipment, like, like we're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think interesting, like for us, when we were making this body, um, working with people who were students, uh, both of the main contributors are in vet school and just had like really extremely busy schedules. I think at the most we were only able to spend like maybe four hours with them or with one of them at a time. So a lot of like how we were making this film was really just coming in, capturing the moment in like an hour, two hours, you know, three hours on a really good day. And then 
we would really just kind of be booted out because they had stuff to do. So in making a film like that, you end up with all these kind of pieces of, uh, you know, pieces of narrative, pieces of a story, and kind of the, the structure of it becomes how do we weave these pieces together? How do we use, you know, narration or voiceover to move us from one scene to another? How do we build relationships uh, within this structure, given that we may only be seeing people for a small amount of time? Um, how are we making those, those, those short periods of time really generative, you know? So that, that was all kind of a process of making the film that was obviously not by choice, but just a part of the environment that we were working in and ultimately had a huge impact on what the structure of the film was, you know? It's really just these short scenes that are kind of tied together to tell this bigger story. Um, I wanna go into production. Yeah. Do you have any strategies um, like when you are interviewing, like to get what you need in short periods of time? Like, have you, do you feel like you've mastered that over time? Say that one more time. I'm wondering if you have any strategies or like ways that you ask questions so that you can get um, the information that you need in, in short pockets of time, basically. I don't know if I would be the best person because I feel like I'm always trying to explore how something feels rather than what it is, what happened. So a lot of times it takes me down kind of tangents of conversations like, you know, we'll start with one subject, like tell me about, you know, what was the process like of getting the first vaccine shot and then thinking about it as something that we captured, like, are we how we're we using this voiceover or are we using it as voiceover or is it going to be something where we see the person talking on camera um which usually isn't my favorite method of uh storytelling so i'm always kind of thinking about using it as voiceover um but then are we like are we talking about it in present tense are we talking about it in past tense but then like even just like getting into that conversation then it becomes more about to me well how did it feel what were you thinking about like and then what did those thoughts inspire um so it kind of like i feel like i'll start with like sometimes i'll start with like really big general interview questions and maybe like not that many of them you know like kind of knowing or believing what i think the structure of the story will be or kind of what the scope of a narrative is and just have these kind of big broad strokes questions and then from those questions, we just branch off into other little questions, more about feeling or thoughts or emotions. Um, but I oftentimes, like, I kind of get exhausted after about two hours of interviewing, and then I'm not much good after that. Uh, so I usually come back in for follow-ups, like, at least two or three times within a process. So I think I'm a little long-winded. And I often get a lot of clarity from listening and watching interviews over again. And we'll sometimes have to go back and be like, oh, I, I actually wasn't thinking about that when I was interviewing this person. But watching them say it while not thinking about what else I have to get through in this interview actually allowed me to see how important this thing that they said is to them. And I should go back and actually talk to them about that more. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, that happens a lot. Um, I, looking at this production thing too, I feel like we did kind of like, we touched on a lot of these things, right? Like building relationships, like we had a very different process around that. Um, oh, I guess, you know, I want to ask because, because our stories were so different and the process of making them was so different. Like I had multiple outlines making this body and at one point <laughs> the outline for the film was just the day of the unblinding and so it would like start in the morning like getting ready going into the doctor's office like sitting there in the waiting room having the doctor come in give Sydney her results and then like the feeling of sitting with whatever those results were afterwards mm -hmm. and we actually made that film and it wasn't a good film it, it, so, <laughs> just to talk about how much outlines can change you know we tried a lot of different things until ultimately um you know we kind of settled on looking at the full scope of her journey and 
within that journey, kind of using parts of it as a vessel to explore history and uh, and also kind of the, the larger societal uh, ideas around trust and distrust in the medical industry. Um, and I also want to say, like, during production, just as an offhand question, you know, I think I asked Sydney, like, do you, is there anybody in your life who, like, who thinks, you know, not negatively, but who, like, actually doesn't think that what you're doing is a good idea, or who would say, like, I would never take the vaccine, or I would never be in a trial, and actually just from that question is how we identified um, Kiara Coleman, who was kind of the Sydney's friend and classmate, but also kind of the foil to her journey, and I think probably equally, I mean, definitely equally as important as a part of the story as Sydney, because I think Kiera represents a lot of people's real fear and anxiety and distrust towards doctors and towards the medical industry. And I think her story is also a lot of other Black women's stories about being, you know, her mother's story being neglected in, uh, in the delivery room. You know, so that became like this really kind of important uh, an important part of, of telling this this bigger story about trust and distrust was and, and it just came from asking the question like you know who in your in your community is doesn't necessarily agree with what you're doing and i wonder for you in the in the process of making your story and in, in the process of production was there a moment that felt like a turning point of making the film where you thought you knew what you were doing you thought you had the story down and then one question or one comment or one action changed the direction of what it what it turned out to be. Interesting. Yeah, man, I, I think the story that I was really, I, I think I was really trying to display an experience. Um, yes, that, you know, the you can't stop spirit is, I, I do believe it, there is an arc and it has a story, but I think I was really trying to make the film feel like a song um, or multiple songs or just, it was really um, intended to be a vibe or a feeling, right? Um, but within that, I was exploring what, um, I was exploring identity basically, like what were, what, what were they like when the, when before they transformed into baby doll, what what is life like, you know, when people don't see them as a doll, and um, how do people receive them? How how do they see themselves, right? And what's the power that you gain within yourself as you're transforming? So I think I knew that I wanted the whole film to be about the evolution of um, the individual of these women and like just like the strength that can be found in transformation and healing. Um, but I don't know if that answers your question. You're saying basically, was there a time where I thought I knew what I wanted and <laughs> like I had to pivot or change the story around a bit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess maybe even like more broadly, like was there a moment that really surprised you uh, in the process of making the film? Yeah, I think all, I think this was this film was really like my test on how I wanted to approach filmmaking in general. And um, I was exploring my process. I didn't, like I said, I didn't go to film school or anything like that. So I was just like really allowing myself to be free with how I was approaching everything. And I didn't really um, intellectualize the process too much for myself. I just captured things and like put them together in the end and I worked with an editor and things like that. But um, yeah, I think it, it that there are definitely challenges that come with that. Um, you know, I remember being in post during, right when the pandemic hit and had to realize that, you know, I didn't have enough imagery that overlaid, um, that went over some of the, the sound bites that I captured. So I wound up having to go back to New Orleans and shoot. So there was a lot of that happening um, because I wasn't as organized story-wise story or I didn't have like a set outline. Um, there were definitely moments um, during my collaborations with, um, you know, different crew members where, you know, we realized or came to the the um, conclusion that, oh my goodness, I may have to go back and um, shoot some beauty shots. So 
that's how um, there's a scene um, at the Marini Opera House where the women are dancing, uh, you know, in, in, in the space. And I wound up having to shoot that like in August of 2020, you know, during COVID. So every, I had to really move cautiously with that. Um, and yeah, so you, I learned so many lessons during the process. Um, that's why it's so interesting to hear you talk about how you go about your work and um, like how organized you are because now as I'm moving into doing other projects, I'm like, I need to, <laughs> I need to own in a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I can't just free flow all the time. I have to like yeah. have some strategy, you know? <laughs> the organization is a myth. I mean, my, if you saw my outlines, you'd be like, what is this? And so, you know, I mean, you can organize as much as you can, but oh. I think ultimately, like I'm also a person who, I think I learned the most from just watching footage and also mm -hmm. just like, from working with footage like I feel like I could outline and outline and outline but there's nothing nothing like sitting down with my editing suite and actually just putting pieces you know in place on a timeline and that'll tell yeah. you if, if it doesn't or if something flows and you know like you I, I'm very lyrical when it comes to the way that I like to edit and put stories together so it's like a lot of different factors that go to like telling a story like does it make sense but does it also flow really well? Does it like make me happy as an edit? Like are the two images that are being juxtaposed together within the space of this edit, like do those please me? Do they kind of make sense? Do they contrast? Do they communicate with each other? So I'm also like thinking about all these things when I'm, when I'm editing. And I think this is a perfect segue to go into post-production. Yeah. Which is uh, when you actually want to go. <laughs> I feel yes, like the film like the takes on a whole different life in post production. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I mean, I think about like how did my story change and transform, and and what was the original spark. And I'll be honest with you, there was like a point in making my film where I was thinking about it like pretty stylized, and I was like, mm -hmm. what if this film is like almost like a noir-esque story about like investigating the medical industry and like putting trust like on trial and trying to understand like where distrust comes in and like where doctors are are culpable for their or you know for their mistakes and for their neglect um and that's not at all the film that I ended up making so it just like and I, and I learned that actually through like putting footage together with sound and experimenting with different music and using some of the other scenes that I had shot with other people and some of the other B-roll that I had shot, um, especially like those larger shots of the city, because that was like a huge component of, of kind of the initial process of filming, was just trying to communicate the idea of the individual body, the singular body, but also kind of the collective body that we live in um, and trying to visually, visually communicate those two ideas together. But, you know, I think like when I was actually sitting down and taking my uh, interview clips and building a, a string out just based on like what, what was the best way to tell this story, it became, you know, first, well, this is Sydney's story. And then second, this is Sydney and Kiera's story. Third, this is their story together, actually. This is about them. This is about their relationship together and kind of and then, you know, after that, well, what, what defines or what influences rather the way that they're thinking about their journeys, you know, and that's their family. And so then it's like, oh, who are those people that are important, you know, factors in their lives or influence, uh, influences in their lives and people that they love who, who they look to for support or guidance. And then all of those things, you know, became what were what were essential to actually making the film and what were essential to me to tell the story and they became the structure of the film and everything that seemed superfluous like the voices of doctors that we interviewed or you know these sequences of of like just people moving about the city or like larger shots of kind of like my, uh, ma macro scale shots of like the city, like those became less important and became more of kind of 
interstitial uh, transitional moments of moving through space, uh, you know, illustrating a little bit of how the subjects themselves were moving through these, these kind of, uh, you know, communal bodies, the being the city or from the city to where Sydney's grandmother was in Mississippi um, and less the focus of the story. So I think a lot changed when I actually was able to sit down and look at the footage and start cutting the footage together. Um, and then, you know, because, because we were working in a cohort, we did have, like you mentioned earlier, like we had a lot of feedback. We were getting, Lauren and I were getting feedback from, I think it was like nine different people from three, spread across three different organizations. And so like, you know, outside of our own desire to make this film that we wanted to make as, as artists and as storytellers, we were also, you know, getting very helpful, I will say, uh, feedback from a lot of different people. And so all of that feedback, I think you, you know, you take it into consideration and you consider it within the scope of what in the story, what's the story that I'm making or what's the story that I'm trying to make. And, you know, you take what feedback makes sense and what seems vital like if someone's not understanding something then that's definitely something that you need to uh attend to um yeah and all of that i think had a big part in in actually forming the story and then you know outside of all of that i think i'm also always trying to remember to ask myself how true is this film to the original spark and like we talked about in the beginning, kind of the original spark was how are Black Americans feeling about the vaccine trial? And what are the dynamics of distrust that influence the way that people feel? So in history, and so thinking about those two things, just trying to, to be, I think, true to, to that initial intention and to make the film that best, uh, that succeeded the best, I think, in, in communicating those two ideas. And so I feel like that's what we ended up with, but it was a process of, of making multiple different films, uh, getting feedback from a lot of different people and really just experimenting with story uh, to get to what became this body. Definitely, like I probably, I experimented a lot and, um, you know, you mentioned reviewing the footage and taking time to to listen and, and look at what you captured and then based on that going back and I'm thinking about um, you know one specific protagonist in my film Shandrika, Shandrika Clark she plays the um, she's a, a former stripper and exotic dancer in the film that tied back to the history of um, the woman, um, the baby, the original baby dolls coming out of Black Storyville and being in the sex working industry. Um, I remember listening to Shandrika's audio um, time and time again, I really was trying to figure out how do I incorporate the voice and the energy of the, um, the women who, you know, pretty much started becoming baby dolls, right? And how can I do it in an innovative and stylistic way? And so that's what brought me to, to Shandrika. And, you know, in our interview, she had mentioned um, not feeling really seen or not feeling respected when she was dancing um, all the time by men. And, you know, I heard, I didn't have any footage that went over that audio. Um, I remember somehow the footage got lost or, you know, it was one of those quirks that happened on set. So I was like, okay, I have to go back to her and figure out how, you know, I'm going to get an image to go over her part. And, you know, I had during, during, um, during production, I said, you know, let's, let's film her dancing. She doesn't dance anymore, but let's film her dancing and let's have her play out a version of what she, you know, formerly was or used to engage in, right? And um, then, you know, there was this moment where I wanted to get some portraits of her outside and I had told Calvin to shoot her close up, like stream close up of her eyes. And then when I came back into post, you know, it clicked and um, really synthesized for me that 
she's talking about not feeling respected, but you know, I made this decision to have the audience look in her eyes for an extended period of time. And for me, I made that choice because you know, now she is, you, you can't not respect her. Whoever, whoever, you know, may want to judge that lifestyle, may want to, you know, think differently about her character or her as a woman, you have to empathize with her by looking in her eyes, right? So, you know, I, I definitely see the, um, the advance of being able to have time with your footage and um, go back and, and film things so that you can have multiple meanings happening at the same time, you know, with it, with the image and, and with the audio bed. Yeah, I think that that also brings up a really important point that I, I think someone else threw in the chat, um, which is a question that I had, which is like, and we can go to the next slide, uh, which is kind of the, the extended life of the or like the distribution phase or after production. Um, and even like outside of looking at distribution, because I actually have that at the very bottom. And the first thing that I think about is what is your accountability to the subjects in the film or the contributors or the characters? Because ultimately you work with these people for a certain amount of time, the film is made, the film goes out into the world, you know, in perpetuity, it's gonna be out there. And you still have to move within that community. I mean, unless you just are the kind of filmmaker who like never talks to your subjects again, uh, which I don't think that that's who you are, who I am as a filmmaker. And so I wanna like kind of open that question to both of us is like, how do you, how do you remain accountable to your contributors? And there's another part of that question too that I'll, I'll jump into after this, after we kind of talk about this. Yeah, so how do I remain accountable to my contributors in terms of um, how do I show up for them, you know, during the process, you mean? Yeah, both. I think in the process, even in, because you kind of touched on it too, like in the post process, when you're putting these images together, like you want to be careful about how someone is going to comprehend these images. And in working with someone who works in sex work, like, People bring their own kind of, you know, individual feelings towards that. But you as a maker have to be conscious of what other people might feel, but also be honest to how that person feels about their own line of work and show it respect. So, you know, I feel like all of those things are kind of swirling around to that, that ultimately led you to make that decision of like, let's be close on her eyes or, you know, or however. Definitely. I think... Um, well, I, I show everybody, all the women in my film, I had a private screening for them prior to the film being distributed or, you know, being going to festivals. It was really important to me that I got their, um, that, you know, I got their permission after putting it together. Like, how do you feel about it? How do you, because at the end of the day, I truly wanted them to feel, um, as if the film was for them, you know, you know, this is their legacy, this is their history, this is their story. And I think as transformative is it that as transformative as the film is for the public, it's also as transformative um, for them for them and to be able to see themselves on screen, to be able to see their growth and to have a marker of, of their lives is, you know, it's it's a thing. So I definitely practice um, various um, codes of ethics when working with um, the protagonists and I, I'm in touch with a lot of them. Um, some of them I'm closer to than others. There's so many voices and women in my film, but every time I'm in the city, I always hit probably all of them up just to check and see how y'all doing, you know, you wanna have drinks or what have you. Um, it's not, a thing where I go in and film and, and it's and it's done. Um, we're very actively in one another's lives and um, they can call me if they need to talk or anything. Yeah, I think it's important to you to know that like, it is a part of the process to be sharing works in progress edits with 
the contributors or the subjects of the film. I think a lot of people don't do that because they're afraid that somebody might say something or dislike something that would ultimately make them know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a necessary part of the process for people to know how their story is being told because they might say something that could illuminate actually something that can make the film better. So I don't, don't want to think about it as a risk, but actually think about it as an opportunity to improve your film. And if your intentions are, are good, if your intention is to make a film that tells someone's story honestly, um, and it doesn't have to be positive, it doesn't have to be necessarily negative, but just honestly, then I feel like you can have those conversations transparently that, you know, where you can really talk about what your ideas and intentions are for making a film. And it doesn't have to be a secret of like, well, I'm trying to do this and I want to tell a story in this way. Um, right. I don't think that that's really accountable with documentary filmmaking, which yeah. brings up this important question that somebody asked earlier, which is, and I always think about it as like, who decides who can make a certain film? Hmm. Right. A lot of people say like, you're not a part of this community. Right. How do you, you know, who, why are you the person that's making this film? And um, I remember I was like at this workshop one time with uh, Jackie Olive and Jackie Olive said, you know, I think that that is not actually the best question, but maybe the better question is how are you making the film? Not who's making the film, but how, how are they making the film? Um, and I think that's really a question about process and about accountability and how you're showing up for the contributors in your film. And also not just when you're talking to them about making the film, when you are making the film, but after the film is made and how are you engaging them if you are and if you decide to after the film is out in the world and how are you having conversations with them when you're editing and, and putting together the story. I think those are all, uh, I think those all kind of go into how you're making the film. And if, if you are accountable to your, to the contributors and the subjects of the film, you're open to feedback, you're open to criticism, you're open to change, mm -hmm. then I feel like ideally you should, you are the person to make that film. Mm. Which might be a controversial statement, but I'm gonna just say it. Yeah, no, these are, these are definitely great things to think about. Um, I think that they, for me and in, in my project, um, you know, they were pretty welcoming. They wanted their stories to be told. I think that's, that's a big telltale sign. Like, do the people want you to tell their stories or not? You know, they can totally decline if they don't feel comfortable. They're not gonna invite you to their homes or to different events if they don't want you to tell the story. So I think that's, that's something to look at too, you know, relationship and connection to the people is so important. Um, and, you know, you know that a lot documentary filmmaking is a lot about, we, we do have to document events a lot in order to progress the storyline. And the only way you're gonna know about what's happening is if they tell you. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think also, I mean, I think being, I don't, I don't know if this helped, but I can assume that um, being a, a woman of color and for them to be able to feel comfortable with telling me certain personal experiences um, probably contributed to what I was able to, to achieve, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel that. And I think, you know, but I also think like going into a space with empathy, and also with the intention of knowing that it is a space of sharing, like totally. not just a extraction of the story, but also, you know, I put myself out there. I tell people things in the space of an interview, not just to elicit a response, but I think it is a conversation uh, between people. And when you're working with people, you're, you're hoping to develop a connection about a certain topic or about a certain subject. And you do kind of have to, you have to be vulnerable in those situations and you have to be vulnerable in the relationships that you're building, whether they're the people in the film or they're the collaborators that you're working with to make the film. And I think all of those are just so 
integrally important to the process of telling a good story. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, well, in the sake of time, Xander Shea, how are we looking on time? Should we move into questions? Yeah, we've got plenty of questions if y'all want to get started with that. Cool. Where should we start? Um, all right. So I can go ahead and feed some of them to you that I've seen in the chat. Uh, one that I see is, um, how much do you think a documentary must follow a narrative structure, a sort of beginning, middle, and end? And in what circumstances can you or have you veered away from that? That's from Stuart. Great so, question, right? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm curious to hear what Zach has to say though, because I feel like I'm like, uh. <laughs> oh, me? Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's um, go with Zach first. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I've watched a lot of films in my life and I, I take influence from a lot of different spaces. And, um, you know, one of my film one of my favorite filmmakers is Chantal Ackerman. Uh, and I, I feel like Chantal Ackerman really uses the, the format of film to communicate uh, an emotional state or to push viewers to focus on what might seem mundane hmm. in a way that is uh, extremely, I don't know, it's, it's proficient, but it's, it's just also like really kind of beautiful and, and requires a lot of patience. Um, so I guess in saying that, like, I don't think that films necessitate a three act structure. I think you can make a film that has no structure or it has the most structure in the world. I think that one of the things I think about a lot with filmmaking is filmmaking is an art form for the public, you know, depending on how you think about it. I mean, there are films that are made, you know, for different spaces, but ultimately in making a film that I know is going to be broadcast on PBS, I'm making a film that needs to be uh understandable palpable and entertaining mm -hmm. to an audience uh public television watchers so in thinking about that i am thinking about how do i tell an interesting story and how do i tell a story in a structure that people do understand and you know and that people are used to and that's a part of my kind of creative process of, of telling a story is just thinking about who my audience is and how are people gonna understand this film within that audience and within the space that it's gonna be shown. And, you know, to a certain extent, I don't do it all the time, but, but definitely to a certain extent, I wanna craft a film that people can understand. I wanna craft a film that given the audience that it's gonna be presented in, they can watch it from beginning to end, be entertained, learn something, feel something, uh, and I think that's important. And that's kind of the power of what filmmaking is, is that like it can be an art form that can be subtly tailored to fit a specific audience, but then hit you over the head with something that you weren't expecting. And I think that, you know, it kind of works as this entryway into really amazing and beautiful emotional experiences and, and ideas. So I think it depends on the project when I think about structure, but for this specific film, I was definitely thinking about the three act structure. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel, I feel you, Zach, on so many levels. It's like, it's, it starts with like, who is your audience? Who is the film for? Um, and like, what do you want people to feel? What, what do you want them to learn? What, what do you want them to understand while I think also being an artist and challenging people's um, own ability to take in information and challenge their their own understanding. I think in You Can't Stop Spirit, I um, I think initially had started out um, just experimenting and 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 seeing how um, I can divert from the narrative while also bringing it back to to the main arc. Um, I thought a lot about how my brain works and I feel like, you know, when I'm thinking or daydreaming, I see so many things at once. Like I could be in one space and then, you know, 30 seconds later, I'm in a totally different space. So I kind of wanted to model how like 
disconnected my brain sometimes and how like I, I would joke and say like I feel like I think in collages like you know you see this big piece and the images don't seem to be related but if you look at the big picture it is all related so I modeled um, my work like that in some way and um, surprisingly I could say that it it came out successfully I didn't intend for it to get picked up on uh, New York Times Optox or PBS, I, I was pretty surprised, but you know, it has elements of structure and it has elements of um, narrative and through line, but then there are these moments where it's like, okay, now we're going somewhere totally different. But I made sure, I think me and my editor, uh, Kit, we made sure when it came back, it the, the diversion made sense. So, I think my uh, my advice would be like definitely to experiment, I think, as much as possible first. And then like you can always bring it back because I think when you're making stuff for the public, you know, people want to see something innovative and fresh. People want to see something they've never seen before or felt before. They want to feel awakened. So I think to to be able to um, uh, allow yourself to to step outside of, of boundaries is good, but also, you know, working with different collaborators can help own in on like, okay, what is, what is like the bigger picture here? I think for me, the bigger picture of the story is always more important than, oh, I made a really like experimental choice um, in this section, you know? Mm, yeah, makes sense. Great question and really great answers. Thank y'all. And this one comes from Jason and I, can, I can't hear you know, a response to this question enough. I think it's so important. How do you take care of yourselves emotionally and spiritually before and after the completion of your films? Hmm. And I think even question. during, you know, <laughs> depending on how long they run. Yeah. Um, therapy, I feel like really helpful um not so much with this body but for another story that i was working on last year that was about someone who was murdered uh that was a very heavy experience of being in the process of making that story and working with the family and, and going to sites that this person had been to and, and ultimately where their uh where their body was found it's heavy and it, it sits with you and it makes you think about, you know, all the existential things that that being that close to the end of life uh, in such a way makes you think about. And yeah, I would, I, you know, tried to go on walks, talk to my partner about it, um, tried to remain open and vulnerable to feeling those things, but also like being outward with what I was feeling and talking to my therapist about it and telling them what was going on and how I was feeling and, and just kind of having avenues uh, for the outlet of the weight of those emotions, I think is important. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Um, I've never, I, I probably should, but I haven't gone to therapy yet for the work that I do. And, you know, it definitely gets heavy sometimes, but a lot of the things, a lot of things I do, I exercise, I used to play tennis in college. So I always found, I always go back to like moving my body, getting out of my head is probably the most important thing. Like after talking to people, you know, over the phone for hours, I'm like constantly like running through things that they told me or feeling the emotions that they felt when they, you know, recall certain things that have happened in their life. So I really try to do things to get out of my head. Um, meditation is good. I don't do it all the time, but like when it's like down to that point, I'm like, okay, let me just sit still, quiet my thoughts, count to 10 <laughs> over and over again, just like try to get the thoughts out of my mind. I think for this work, like we're like, we're, we're experiencing life and we're in the flow with people. And then we go home and we intellectualize everything. So <laughs> that I think I have to turn that off sometimes, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm seeing all these connections here. Um, meditation, exercising, also talking it out with friends um, is really helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. I want to co-sign everything y'all said and just point out that, you know, this is 
something that's super important for filmmakers who are, like you said, constantly intellectualizing everything that they interact with. It, it, it comes back to a personal level as well. And I think uh, it's so important to carve out space for embodiment practices, for meditation, for therapy, for stillness, and just sitting with and understanding um, what your feelings are, or not trying to understand them, but just feeling them and giving them, you know, the space to, uh, to leave. So that's a really important question. Um, another one that we have is how often do you find a story or a protagonist that doesn't end up in the film? Uh, and how do you, you know, sort of make the decision to, to not include it? That's real. That's like, yeah. yeah, I've definitely interviewed so many people for um, this previous work. Um, and I think like, they're just like, just on base level, there's like just certain uh, protagonists that I'm inherently drawn to. And um, after the first few initial conversations or, you know, how open they are or how close they are, sometimes I tend to follow people that don't tell it all in, in the beginning process um, because I'm always trying to, I think I'm, I'm more interested in people who are not um, so open in the beginning because it's like, it's a journey. Like we're growing together, they're growing. And like, I want, there's, there's more to the person that, that maybe meets the eye or that initially is displayed. So I kind of um, base it that way. But it is, you know, they're, if they don't get a, a huge part in the work, maybe their image is in the work or, you know, it's, it's all based on like post two, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that too. I mean, I feel like, especially for this body, we interviewed a ton of people who ended up not being a part of the film. But, you know, I also think that like, you know, there's like being a part of the film, like being in the film, and then there's being a part of the film. So I feel like everybody that we interviewed, like the ideas and the insights that we gleaned from those interviews ultimately influenced the way that the story was going to be told or was told. Um, so whether or not they made it, you know, physically or visually rather into the film, I think that it was important to to talk with them or film them or whatever you know we did together because I think it ultimately influenced the film. And then you know when you're sharing the film with people and people don't end up in the film, but you did a shoot with them, you just tell people like you know I really appreciate you spending your time with me to talk with me to do this shoot. Um, you know ultimately we decided to go a different direction with the film and what we shot didn't make it to the film but you were such an important part of the conception of this film and I appreciate your time and your insights and yeah and thank you for sharing it with me and just like having those conversations with people and people usually understand. That's helpful and that's a great sort of script to <laughs> memorize when you don't know how to approach that. Um, I have two more questions that I'd like to try to get into before we we close. Uh, one is, uh, and this is sort of a general question that I think is asked in most filmmaking panels, just, you know, what are some general tips when it comes to financing or funding a documentary? Where can someone who's looking to make their first documentary look towards uh, to get started financially? Well, yeah, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. There's, I mean, there's plenty of grants. I, I, I've definitely applied for lots of grants in my life and still apply all the time. Southern Doc uh, Fund has an amazing uh, development grant. I think they have a production grant as well. Uh, True False Film Society, uh, they have a grant, um, which I think might be like an editing grant. Uh, but yeah, I think just like there are databases that have like dot grants on them and like kind of specifically breaking down like if it's for pre-production or production or post-production or like impact producing or if it's for documentary work or scripted work or experimental work um yeah and I think just like researching and and figuring out which grants best suit your specific project and then working on those totally and to um to add to to that I think 
something that's like really important is talking about your film as much as possible and letting people know what you're doing and what you're working on. Because, um, you know, within the industry and even people that may not seem to be in the industry that you're in, you just, you just never know who um, is going to be inspired by what you're creating. You don't know, you know, if the person, people you're talking to know people that you know, can connect you to, to finding some funding. But I, I really found that just being so transparent about what I was creating, it, it lent a lot of support to, to my work and funding support. Totally agree, totally agree. Yeah, if, especially if your film is um, facing a certain issue, there are, there are grants that are specific towards that or it, it targets a, a specific community or anything it's all about that research and our final question and you've both sort of gotten into this a little bit so I'll just I'll leave space open in case there's anything that you want to add um, because I know you spoke about uh, you know what what your role is to the characters involved in your film and the question was what does compensation or reciprocity look like for the protagonists featured in your works yeah I think that's a really great question. Um, I, I mean, oftentimes, uh, I just, like, pay people. Like, in some way, try to build in uh, stipends. And it's usually, like, you know, it's not what people are necessarily worth, but it is a gesture of kindness and appreciation. But I always try to build in a stipend for uh, people especially on short films, like, you know, administrative costs or professional advising or something like that. And that goes straight to the contributors. Um, and then in longer form work, uh, I think it, it becomes a question of points and, uh, and, and kind of how can contributors who've spent years working on something with you, making something, having their lives documented, how can they continue to benefit from the film after it's out in the world? And I think giving them a share of actual ownership of the film uh, becomes an important conversation. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm like huge on reciprocity. And to be honest, it's quite a bit of work for the protagonist to be in, in our films, um, you know, we are, they're doing quite a bit of recalling memories and, you know, we're directing them sometimes on like what to do. So it's definitely, you know, a question and a question that comes up when you're making documentary because oftentimes people tell you, oh, you're not supposed to pay um, protagonists. But similar to Zach, I, I work it in some way, somehow. Um, the antenna grant that I received um, for You Can't Stop Spirit um, was, it required me to factor in like a way to, you know, offer some type of long-term support to the dolls. And I had um, funded some of their um, attire for the, the year that I had been filming them. So that, that was something that I did. Um, and also I know a lot of people, they, you know, if we're filming in someone's home, you know, you can, you can pay for the location. Like that's a way to pay them, you know, directly and factor it into your budget as well. Yeah, that's a good point too. I feel like in making my feature, like working with musicians, like we're paying music licensing fees. Right, right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> this has it's been super valuable, y'all. Oh, sorry, Zach, did you have one more thing? No, I'm just saying that's that's a good way to compensate people and actually make it make sense with the budget. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I feel like there's uh, you've offered so much wisdom <laughs> with uh, with this conversation. If everyone asking, yes, it will be recorded, and so we'll reissue it out for our wrap report. Um, but thank you so much for using your films as case studies. It's really a rare opportunity to hear people speak to specific examples of what this process looks like from phase to phase. Um, and thank you everyone in the chat who's been engaging with the conversation.